Hello. Hi. Good afternoon. Hi, Hi Indidi. Good afternoon. Hi. Okay, can we just give me? it one minute. Yes, I can hear you. Um, okay. Perhaps you could maybe project a bit more so it's a, lot, a little louder. Okay. Thank you. Better now. E, can you um, say something so we can um, test your audio too quickly? Ian, can you hear us? Ian, can you hear us? Hello, Ian. Can everyone hear us? I think, um, all right, in the chat box, we can, okay, loud and clear, great. Um, Ian, can you just confirm so we can go ahead, that you can hear us and that um, your volume is, your sound is good. Okay, so sorry about this. Yes. Okay, we're just going to go ahead. Um, um, by way of um, and start, hopefully, e, you can confirm to us, please, that you can yeah, hear. Yeah, I'm here. Oh, I'm great. Here. Yeah, we're good. Thank you. Great. Okay. Good afternoon, um, everyone, and welcome to uh, the Business Ideas Hub business webinar titled Launching and Scaling in Today's Business Environment. Uh, thank you for taking out the time to join us. Uh, this webinar is organized by the Business Ideas Hub, um, a, group of boarding and a group for boarding and established entrepreneurs under the community group initiative of the Covenant Nation. Um, for more information about our community groups, please log on to www.insightsforliving.org to learn more. Um, I am Edmond, Edmond Idokoko, a member of the Business Ideas Community Group, and I'll be moderating this session. Today, we're privileged to have two business experts with us, Indidi Unili and um, Ian Boyeji. They will be answering questions submitted by all of us and sharing from their wealth of experience. So get your notebooks, get your pens, find a comfortable place to sit, and let's prepare to learn. Please note that if you are un unable to register, this webinar is being broadcasted live on our YouTube channel on Mix, uh, Mix LR and also on insightsforliving.org slash radio. So uh, you could um, join and, and um, join the class and learn from us. Okay, so we're going to move on quickly to um, our panelists and um, we're going to quickly ask you to introduce yourself, starting with Indidi, and just give us some, um, uh, take a minute or two to give us a bit about your background, um, and we will move on from Indidi to to In. Indidi, over to you. Thank you very much. I am a proud Nigerian, um, a proud member of the Covenant Nation family, a big beneficiary of all the good work the Covenant Nation is doing. Um, in my professional capacity, I am the managing partner and co-founder of Sahel Consulting, which works across Africa, transforming the agriculture and food landscape. I'm the chair of NourishingAfrica.com. It's a new digital business that we've just launched in the midst of COVID, uh, envisaged as a hub for a million entrepreneurs in the food and agriculture landscape. I'm the co-founder of Ace Foods, which is an agro-processing company, and the founder of Leap Africa. And apart from that, I'm just someone who is very, very committed to living a life of purpose. Uh, today, we heard about the passing of um, Chadwick Boseman, and I've been very, very 
rattled by that. It's just another reminder for all of us in the community of faith about how critical it is to live very deliberate and purpose-driven lives. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ndidi. E, over to you. Sure. Um, my name is E Aboyeji. Um, most people call me E. Um, I am currently a general for Africa's future. Um, we're a people-powered innovation fund that supports innovators who are turning our continent's biggest challenges into global business opportunities. Um, prior to the fund, um, I helped lead, found and co-found and lead uh, two, two of uh, the continent's largest technology companies, um, Andela, which was focused on uh, helping uh, young people who are interested in a career in software to get jobs with uh, global technology companies around the world. And uh, Flutterwave, which, was, which is connecting um, local and global businesses uh, to Africans and vice versa. Um, by providing global payment platforms and options. Um, for for me, I was uh, I was uh, I was born uh, in in Yaba. I'm, uh, I'm not a Covenant Nation member, but I'm a Foursquare member. Uh, where we share a lot of the same precepts in many ways, um, and uh, and uh, I, I consider myself a child of God. I'm very much like Auntie Didi has said, very committed to. Um, living God's purpose on earth by building businesses that can help us transform our many challenges as a people into global business opportunities. Thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, very inspiring. And I think we'll just dive right into the questions um, that have been submitted. So um, I would like to start with the first question. And um, it's 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 pretty simple, but uh, let's 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 um, let's d dig into it. What, what was your major motivation for embarking on this path of entrepreneurship, and um, what 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 are the factors that you can I, um, outline that have made you successful within the business environment? I would like to start with Indidi, and um, Indi will take up after that. So I've always been motivated by anger. And I always tell entrepreneurs, you're either motivated by joy, passion, or anger. And for me, um, my motivation, is basically seeing problems in my society that upset me and trying to do something about it. And I believe God opens our eyes to see things and stirs up within us burdens and emotions. And if we're sensitive to his spirit, we can detect what he's telling us at any point. And so for the last 12 years, I've really been focused on the food and agriculture landscape because I was really angry about the fact that even though we're naturally endowed for agricultural excellence as a continent, we remain net importers of food and 30% of our children are stunted. Um, food is expensive in this part of the world. The average family cannot enjoy three square meals a day. And that made me angry because it's unacceptable. And so I've devoted the last 12 years to working to address food insecurity by creating business models that solve these issues. So Ace Foods is a for-profit business. We source from 10,000 farmers. We process for the local market. And we have proven through our small business that you can source locally and produce high quality food that rivals food anywhere else in the world. Today, Ace Foods actually exports to South Africa and to Europe. Um, and we have customers who are um, partnering with us across Nigeria and across the world. And that's just one example of what is possible in our ecosystem. Um, and then in terms of when I look back at my career over the last 25 years, he called me Auntie Ndidi. Um, I, I've been around for a while, 25 years. I would say there are three, three key issues or key three attributes. The first is really being grounded in what God has called me to do being obedient to his leaning. When we decided to go into agriculture, a lot of people thought we we're crazy. Um, and if we were listening to the world, we wouldn't go into the sector, um, but we decided to listen to God. So just being very clear about being obedient to God's leaning and you know, forgetting what the world says. Um, now everybody says we're so strategic, but at the time they said to Harvard, graduates, you could be making millions of dollars. Why would you start a business and be earning 50,000 naira a month? It doesn't make sense. The second is 
humility, 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 humility to unlearn, learn, and admit that you don't know. Um, it's really important to stay grounded and stay humble. I, I remember going for days to try and collect money from goodies. They had finished selling our spices and they won't pay us. And they'll, I'll, I'll be there waiting and they'll say, wait outside, wait outside, ma madam. And they'll shout at me. And nobody knew, you know, I have a national honor. I'm a young global leader. You know, I, my peers are, are CEOs globally. And here I am being chastised by a, a cashier. And if you're not humble, you can't pay the price. If you can't pay the price, you can't reap the reward. And so humility is really, really critical. And then the third thing I'll say is you have to surround yourself with helpers. And for every business, from the day I've conceived a business, and I've, I've started five directly, but I've helped start about 20. The first thing I do is I constitute a board of directors. I get helpers. I institute governance, transparency, ethics. Um, I surround myself with mission-driven high achievers, people who take the mission forward. And I'm sure we'll talk more about this, but being strategic about how you get help from the governance at the top to the bottom and surround yourself with people who will achieve this great impact and vision you've set for yourself is really critical. Thank you. So inspiring. E, over to you. Um, so so the, the, the two questions, just, um, just, so, just so I'm clear where, um, what inspired me to get into entrepreneurship and what I've yeah. been responsible for whatever I consider success so far, because I don't, I don't necessarily right. consider myself <laughs> successful. Um, but, but yeah, I'm, I'll, start, I'll start with um, what inspired me. I think, first of all, it was really, I, I got into the uh, entrepreneurship really from a place of um, both ego and desperation, just like many young people. Um, you know, at first it was interest and then it was ego. Um, I felt like, you know, um, I remember watching the social network in 2010 and thinking to myself, well, if Mark Zuckerberg can do it, does he have two heads? Mm -hmm. um, so, so that was how I got in, really, um, if I'm being honest. Um, but as I, as I started to build companies, I started to recognize the kind of transformational impact that business can have when it's mission focused. Um, and also to draw threads between my experience as a business person in Nigeria and those of business people in other countries that I admire, um, in Germany, in Canada, in the US. Um, and I think there was one major thing I thought was missing in my experience with business people in Nigeria, which was this idea that business, a business is beyond profits, um, is beyond just the profit that it can, it can make. Um, it goes towards the impact. Um, Unfortunately, that, that is an idea that, that still remains a, a, a niche idea um, with business. People believe the primary purpose of business uh, is to make profits. But I felt like calling me uh, to establish a template for mission-driven businesses. Businesses who have the purpose beyond profits was directly impact on people's lives and establish um, an Africa where prosperity and purpose is within everyone's reach. Um, and, and, you know, that has been kind of my, would I say, heaven, heavenly, heaven-inspired mission um, in building business here. It's far, it's, it's less about the profits. I really couldn't care less if many of the businesses uh, deliver a profit, although I think it's important. But, um, but, but it's actually more about what kind of impact can they have. And by the grace of God, you know, we've been used uh, to really impact on the lives of people through the businesses we've built. Whether it was Andela, where we took young people who were earning $100 a quarter uh, to going through our program and coming out on the other side, earning $100,000 a year. Um, or Flutterway, where um, we helped a number of businesses to be able to sell and get paid globally. Right, um, and also support platform businesses like Uber, help people like uh, TransferWise to be able to move money in and out of Nigeria and establish their businesses which employ thousands of people in Nigeria. Yeah. Too, in too terms important. of what has helped make me succeed, 
Go ahead, sir. Yes. Go ahead. So to to impact in terms of uh, in terms of, of what has uh, helped me in being successful, I really echo Auntie Didi's thoughts about hearing the voice of God. Um, very much like her, I've made many career moves that have puzzled people. Uh, <laughs> Um, but but I can guarantee you there were direct direct instructions from God even at the time when I felt a lot of resistance, um, and and quite frankly the resistance was logical, you know you've suffered so much you've got in this business to this point why leave now to go do something else, um, but I think uh, the moment you understand that you're God's vessel, um, you you change your approach and you understand that everything that you're doing. Uh, you have to put the kingdom of God first. And so many cases, you know, once I'm divinely instructed, I, I, I immediately proceed to obey. And that has been a huge saving grace for me. Um, two other things that have been helpful for me. One is um, really taking my time to build fantastic teams and work with fantastic teams. I like to tell um, people who work with me that the difference between um, a million dollar business or a million naira business and a billion naira business to bring it home is that for a million naira business, it's one man who can build a decent business on his own. For a billion naira business, it's a group of people who each could have built million naira businesses but decide to come together and deliver exponential impact. So it's really being able to find those type of people who are impressive in their own rights, could be doing the business by, by themselves but then joining forces with them to deliver exponential impact. And then finally, being extremely focused on impact. Um, a lot of people, like I said, in our business environment, there's so much focus on profit and loss for good reason. And the assumption is that businesses should do whatever to make a profit. Uh, but I put it to you that if you look at the most developed countries in the world, all of them have been built by businesses in their domain. And more importantly, the businesses in their domain do not just consider their function to be profit and loss. They consider their function to be building key institutions for the flourishing of society, for the betterment of society. So for me, I've maintained businesses that have a focus on bettering society, providing jobs for people, providing economic opportunities for people as opposed to just uh, focusing on profits. Wow, these are very inspiring um, 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 explanations from both of you. And I mean, certain things resonate between both of you. Um, Mike Muda put it this way. He said, uh, whatever irks you is, is an indication of what you're created to solve. And like Indidi said, you know, she was angry at, you know, why we had so much and why we have so much in Nigeria and why, you know, we still are, living in lack and in and wallowing in poverty so inspiring so quick, quickly to double click a bit more again because there are quite a lot of aspiring entrepreneurs who are part of this you know um, webinar uh, let's talk a bit more about ideas you know you know developing an idea that works poses a challenge to quite a lot of aspiring entrepreneurs today um, can you tell us a bit from your experience how you arrived at the ideas you implemented um, to succeed um, how did you I mean you just wake up one morning and you know you just knew what to do or you know you, you did you search your your environment to know what the needs were how, how did you how did you go about you know developing that idea um, um let, let's let's take let's take um uh, into the first okay so as as you know i'm a serial social entrepreneur and um with each idea i've really been motivated by as i said anger I'll actually share a model. Um, so I've written two, uh, two books. One is called Social Innovation in Africa, Practical Guide for Scaling Impact. And the one that I'm launching this year is called Food Entrepreneurs in Africa, Building Resilient Agriculture Businesses. And this um, model about how to basically um, identify and then scale, I think is relevant to any sector. So there are seven or six key components of your, your approach. The first one is, that your business model has to be demand driven with measurable value addition. This underscores what E was just talking about. You have to be solving a problem. People have to understand or be willing to pay something for addressing that problem. Or if it's a social enterprise, at least you have to find a funder who's willing to subsidize it. But there has to be measurable value addition. 
And a lot of us create businesses. I have so many young women who I mentor who say, you know, I make cakes or I make clothing. And I'm like, okay, some of your friends will buy it, but do you have hundreds of people, thousands of people? Is it differentiated enough that it can reach millions with impact? The second is that it has to be low cost. I'm not saying low value, I'm saying low cost. It means you have to strip out all the excesses in this value that you're creating so that you have efficient and effective operations to deliver value for money. Especially in this COVID area, people are not going to be willing to just pay because it's from you. The third is that it has to be simple and compelling with a very compelling brand story. Many of us don't know how to package and tell our stories. He has done a fantastic job of positioning himself, building himself, but every entrepreneur, and we see examples in our environment, somebody like Tara has done a very good job. Uh, Mo Abudu has done a fantastic job. You're basically building a brand story around yourself. But even if you don't want to be the brand ambassador, you uh, put your story out there and you tell that story in a compelling way. The fourth is that you have to build resilience into your DNA from day one. COVID-19 is one shock, but there's so many other shocks, climate change and agriculture sector, many, many shocks. DNA, resilience, it means how do, you, how do you withstand shocks and how does your business model withstand shocks? Number five is that it has to engage the community and shape the ecosystem from day one. We don't, you know, we, we all talked about all the Alcada businesses that went out of, that had to rethink their business models when they got state changed policy. There's no business that is not affected by policy, whether you're in tech, whether you're in agriculture, whether you're in the furniture industry, whether you're in the health and education sector, you have to get involved in shaping policy and your business has to be relevant. So many of us start these businesses without even looking to the policy environment and how it affects us. And then the final one is that it has to leverage technology and innovation. There's no business today that can be started without leveraging technology and innovation, either through how you deliver your product or service, how you engage with your customers, how you manage your operations. And I've interviewed 80 entrepreneurs across Africa who are scaling and who have built successful businesses and all of these six resonate with them. And so that's the model I subscribe to. That's what I've learned from others and that's what has worked for me. Thank you. Thank you so much. E, what's your thought on, 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 on um, the I ideas? Yeah, I mean, so when I was much earlier in my career, I put a lot of stock on ideas. And um, <laughs> I must be honest with you, um, it, it didn't quite work out well. Um, I remember my very first startup was called bookneto.com. I started it while I was in school. And the idea was I was going to replace our learning management system. You know, I had identified a problem I thought I could solve <laughs> and I had, I had an idea of how to fix it. And, but I didn't think about a lot of other important things. And, and you know, as I evolved as an entrepreneur, I've come about a, a simple um, um, formula of some sort. A lot of it very much aligned with what Auntie Didi just said, um, but very focused about how to build new businesses. And it really just starts with identifying somebody with a problem, <laughs> right? So identifying one person or one institution that has a specific problem um, and then trying to solve that person's problem exclusively, right? Mm -hmm. And then thinking carefully about what it would take for you to find other people like this person or institution whose problems you've solved and then sell them the exact same solution. Because if one person has a problem, right, there are other people like them who probably have the same problem mm -hmm. and then you can solve their problem. So that's, that has been my process uh, over the last five years, so to speak. Um, whenever I start a business, I tend to look at it as a one customer business initially, almost like a consultant. And then after I've designed a solution that works, then I now look for another person exactly like the first customer who has the same problem and pitch them the exact same solution 
see if it works for them. And then you do it one, you do it twice, you do it three times. Before you know it, you've done it 50 times. Before you know it, you've done it 1,000 times and you have a business. It's a simple course notes version of uh, what <laughs> Anthony said. So please buy the book and follow her advice. <laughs> absolutely absolutely it's it's i mean it's it's turning out to be a, a mini mba class um it, it, all everybody has to go look for that book and buy it okay so let's let's touch on something uh, else that is pretty pretty um um strong in the minds of aspiring entrepreneurs and established entrepreneurs let's talk about funding um it's a major concern for quite a lot of people and um i'm, I'm quite encouraged because of both of your paths then how that you know um, you've also had to to handle issues around funding um, um how, how how should we go about how should the aspiring entrepreneur go about capital acquisition or the existing entrepreneur who wants to scale how should they go about capital acquisition to be able to help them in um, you know in their businesses i mean there are concerns around the interest rates on loans um people not having um collaterals to put on ground to be able to access these loans and things like that but what, what, what's what, what what what's your um take on funding and how entrepreneurs should go about doing this indeed let's take you first okay thank you very much the first thing i would say is that every entrepreneur has to assess what their funding needs are when they need funding and how expensive that funding is you know the Reality is that there's more money chasing entrepreneurs than the entrepreneurs who can absorb it. And most people don't realize that. Um, from our experience, and I'll make it very practical, you start with family. They say always start with family, friends, and fools. You start with your own savings, you start with your own investments, and you start small. And then over time, you take advantage of all the opportunities for startups. Right now, there are accelerators, there are incubators, there are business plan competitions, there are hubs, there are angel investors. There are lots of people who would actually back a good idea that's well packaged, but they won't back you unless you can demonstrate credibility, integrity, and the ability to utilize those funds effectively. If you have surmounted that, then you have to then take advantage of private equity, venture capital, crowdfunding, you know, I always am challenged and I love to tell the story of Mira Meta. Many of you might know Mira. Mira started a company called Tomato Jaws and she was sitting in the United States. She made a video, um, a crowdfunding video to start up a company. At that time, she was going to set it up in Nassau State um, to process tomatoes. And this crowdfunding video raised her $50,000 just on an idea. And through that, people were calling me from all over the world saying, do you know Mira? We want to invest in her company. We want to give up uh, PE. We want to give up uh, venture capital. I was like, really? We want to be angel investors based on a crowdfunding video. And many of you don't believe that crowdfunding videos work, but they do. She has proven it. Now, beyond that, we started Ace Foods. We applied for a business plan competition. It was called Africa Diaspora Marketplace Competition. Since then, we've also gotten funding from the Africa Enterprise Challenge Front, from Innovations Against Poverty, and these have helped us cushion a lot of the growing pains with companies. So I would ask the entrepreneurs here, funding for me is not a challenge. Funding is an opportunity. Now, not all money is good money. Some funding is very expensive. Some funding mm -hmm. is ill-timed. So be very, very strategic about how and when you receive funding, who you receive funding from, and how you manage your relationship with your investors. Because I tell you, many people have made many mistakes because they've been desperate. Never, never take money when you're desperate. Take yeah. money as a strategic tool to use to build your business when you need it and for the purposes that you have intended for it. And once you prove that you are a good steward of money, you will actually be turning money away. That's my advice. Hello? Hello? <laughs> I don't know if we lost. Go ahead, Lee. Go ahead, Lee. I know you have a lot of experience with fundraising. Well, <laughs> we, I guess I, I, I guess so. Um, so I think, I think very much like, like what Auntie Didi said, I, I keep saying this. I mean, she, she's definitely showing her wealth of knowledge and experience in this space. Um, 
the, the, the key thing with funding is to first of all, understand clearly what you require funding for. And um, when, when, I say, when I say that, I, I specifically mean, you know, when you, there are a lot of things that people raise funding for in the earlier stages that they could either rent um, or they could quote unquote share crop, share profit on. Um, a lot of people maybe get, get funding uh, or look for funding to do things that quite frankly, in the earliest days, um, they don't really need funding for in order to demonstrate the idea that they have. Um, so for example, I'll use my example with Flutterwave, right? When we're starting Flutterwave, the requirement from CBN was basically that um, we should um, we should um, we should do uh, I think at the time it was 100 million naira in share capital, and we didn't have 100 million naira in share capital. So what did we do? We had a conversation with the bank and said, hey, if we build the software um, for this payment platform to run. Can we leverage, can we make it your software and we'll just share revenue on it in the favor of the bank? Huh? But doing that meant that we needed and we would. Hello, sorry, can you hear me? <laughs> I can hear you, E. I think uh, yeah. that's somebody's uh, mic is on. It's on, yeah, Are yeah. So, so do yeah, so so doing that meant that we we would we, we would we gave up a lot of revenue in the beginning, but it allowed us to um, it allowed us to actually leverage this bank's license, which they had paid. I mean, they were a billion naira bank, um, but we didn't we didn't now have to go and look for hundred million naira in order to kickstart the business because we were able to um, we were able to actually leverage on other people's resources in exchange for a share of revenue. It's the same thing when it came to distribution. When it came to distribution and we needed to sell um, the software, we partnered with banks um, and told banks, look, can we exclusively serve your customers? The funds will stay in your, in your bank. And that saved us a lot of money with marketing in the initial, um, in the initial time. I remember when I was at Andela, when we were trying to do our program, our first building was, um, was a boys' quarters that was donated to us by, by somebody. Um, you know, it, it took us a lot of effort to get it cleaned up and everything, but we were able to make it work. Our second office was um, an old office in Fadi um, that allowed us uh, to use the offices for a couple months in order to train. Um, so I say this to say that many times when I listen to young entrepreneurs tell me what they want to raise money to do, I find that 95% of the time, there are other resourceful ways of getting the same things resolved without using money. Uh, for technology startups, one common thing, for example, is finding an engineer, paying for software development help. And I always say, you know, that is one of those things that should be a core part of your team, right? If a member of your team cannot write the, the technology or the app for free, um, it, it really gets to the heart of whether what you're building is a technology business that can evolve quickly, depending on how technology intensive it's expected to be. Um, so, so if you get somebody on your team who can write that code for equity, um, then, then you don't need to go and raise money to hire developers in order to do so. Um, so these are like practical approaches to getting over the initial hump. The second thing I like to remind people about funding is that business people, investors, even myself, we rarely fund ideas. Very, very rarely. Um, for me, even, even in my own, even as, as a quote unquote big as I am, um, whenever I'm building a new project, I still have to use my own money to validate that the idea is um, working before I will be taken seriously by any investor. Um, and and for, except for a very few number of people who have the gift of additional gab, so to speak, it's very rare that you just get funded on the basis of an idea. You have to be very focused on execution so that you can show some results, right? Um, and it's those results that then open up 
the gateway of funding to you. Um, so again, back to my first point, think very, very carefully and resourcefully about how you would fund what I would call your pilots. How would you fund a demonstration of the fact that this is doable, right? Then the final thing I would say when it comes to funding is very much like Antindidi said, is integrity. Um, everybody, everybody is, um, um, starts off the same way when it comes to this fundraising business, which is you have no contacts, you have nobody to necessarily fund you. You might come upon a few people who might be willing to take a chance on you, but it's really down to those people. And that will be after you get a lot of no's. Mm. However, when you now get that yes, what do you do with the yes? Mm. It's a very important question. Um, one of the defining experiences that I've had, and a lot of people might not actually know this, but it's one of the reasons why a lot of people feel comfortable funding me again and again and again. It was when I was um, starting out with Andela. So before Andela, we had this company called Fora. And what we were doing at Fora was just, we're selling e-learning courses um, to working professionals. It was a completely different business. But the business was in, it was okay, but it wasn't necessarily doing super well. It wasn't like a high growth business. Now, I could have, I, I was within my rights to say, oh, look, oh, this investment that we did together did not work. So I'm leaving to go and start Andela, um, which was a completely different business from what we were doing. But against my better judgment, to be very honest, I, I didn't do that, right? I decided that I was going to pull along with me investors from Andela. And I was, as I was telling them, look, I am going to build this new business called Andela since this business called Fora didn't work. Please, can you, if you want, you can um, double down in this new company. But this is the portion of the company that I've been given. And this is your portion for my, for my shares. Mm. Now, those shares today are worth millions. Not because they invested in Andela, but because... Uh, they invested in the business before Mandela and from an abundance of integrity, um, I decided to carry them over into the new company because I felt that um, abandoning my investors at that time was not the right thing to do. Uh, logically, you could make the argument that I could have gone the legal way and say, look, we tried out the business. That's why you're an equity holder. It didn't work. But I decided to do the moral thing and carry them along. And those investors till today, they are reliable first checks for any business I choose to do. When I, if many times they would even wire me the money before they receive documents because they know uh, as far as Iniolua is concerned, we will be made whole. And we've done a whole lot of stuff together. Uh, I've made them back their money, not once, not twice, many, many different times. So that integrity of treating investors' capital as sacred, like your own, is really the key to unlocking funding sustainably over a long period of time. Of course, to get there, you will get through many no's. A lot of people will tell you no. A lot of people, some people will tell you yes. But how you treat those people who eventually bet on you is everything when it comes to an investor investing relationship. Hmm. Very, very, very um, um, insightful, actually. Um, so, so just to, to add a bit more or to request for a bit more, um, we, most of the investments that we seem to know uh, or hear about are foreign, right? Um, why is the focus mostly on foreign investors um, and the local funding sources and the local investors who also do, um, who also um, invest in businesses? Um, what really is this whole Series A, Series B, Series C um, um, concept? Are there milestones that you know qualify businesses for these foreign investments? Just just a bit more light on it, so at least people are pretty clear. We are already yeah. clear on what you know, but just a bit more light on it. Sure, um, I can I can explain how it works. So, first of all, I think the context here is technology companies, right? Um, so it's important to state that. I would argue that for many other kinds of businesses, you're probably better off 
working with local investors, like real estate, agric, you know, they understand those needs. We're just starting to see kind of the first wave of local investors who understand the technology asset class in the way that it's originally understood to be. But most of the people who have experience with the asset class and can add real value are, of, of, are foreign, right? There's a lot of local angels that are very good, but formal technology venture funds, they're very few. So that's why a lot of people are more focused on the foreign funding sources because they are the ones who understand the technology asset class. And you never want to take money from an investor who doesn't understand the business you are in. They will, they will require a lot of work to manage <laughs> and they won't necessarily be able to add as much value to your business. So it's always important to look for investors who understand the, the technology asset class, if that's what you're into. Uh, so just setting that context. In terms of round, so the way it works in the technology space, there's an acknowledgement that in order for you to grow fast, you're going to require some funding. And because technology growth is geometric, I don't know how many of us studied uh, math in school, but there's geometric progression and there is uh, arithmetic progression, right? Arithmetic right. progression is one plus one plus one plus one. Geometric progression is one times one. Time. You understand what I'm saying? Right. Technology is geometric in the sense that, you know, it's really a two times two times two times, you know what I mean? Two times times four times six times, times, times eight times. You understand what I'm saying? So it's very geometric. It grows very fast. Because it grows very fast, it requires a significant amount of funding upfront. Because the ultimate goal is that it's in the mass that you're able to get um, the value, so to speak. So if, for example, we use a church, if I wanted to fund VC fund a church, right? I want a church that will grow from two members to eight members to 64 members hmm. to 126 members every Sunday. You are hmm. adding, a, a, just to use a more practical example, as opposed to a church that is growing you know, one, two members, four members, five members, six members, like that, right? So because of that, it, if you're going to be growing members geometrically every Sunday, it wouldn't make sense for you to start in somebody's living room um, past the certain point, right? You would want to build right. a big stadium because in four Sundays, you're going to need... <laughs> you understand what I'm trying to say? So just so I that do. you can picture why people raise money. It's not because they are... Yeah, you know, a lot of people have this misconception that people raise money because they are eating inside. It's really mm. not true, <laughs> you know? Mm. It's because you're growing so fast, you need to make provision for the growth that you're expected to experience. Mm. So when you raise money, what happens is, you know, at the seed level, there's a certain amount of money that's provisioned for you to grow to a certain stage. Now, when you get to that stage, keep in mind that because your growth is geometric, your rate of growth would also increase astronomically hmm. so you need to raise further funding for you to be able to manage that growth until the next stage and the series keep going and going and going until you either um decide you want to stop <laughs> um, or somebody buys your business because of how fast it's going or you decide to ipo that means you go from being privately funded to being funded by anybody in the public, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that's really how the series, um, this, this series funding work. And again, I say this because it's in the technology context that this is true. I don't think this would be true, say, in housing or in agri or something like that. Okay, amazing, amazing. Um, 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 Indeed, you you alluded to something earlier on um, around being careful about your about your equity partners. So. Um, I wanted to ask the question, how does one choose a co-founder? How does one choose the right equity partners? What should entrepreneurs look out for? Uh, uh, maybe you could just tell us, how did you manage through your own experience? How, how does one choose the right equity partners so you're not in business today and tomorrow you've been bought out and you're completely out in the cold? Yeah, thank you very much. I'd actually like to follow up on a couple of things that he, he talked about before I, I address that one. Um, the first one is there is funding locally. I mentioned the Lagos Angel Network. There's also the Lagos State Employment Trust Fund. 
and there are angels everywhere. So for Ace Foods, when we decided to buy our factory, we actually did a private placement, which means that we actually raised money from friends and family in a structured way. So we sold a portion of our business to others. And because I'm, my husband is a co, my co-founder, the co-founder of the company, and he has a finance background, we could do it ourselves. And what we did was to basically find people who were passionate about the business and were willing to invest in us. And this points to the issue that E talked about. People don't invest in ideas, they invest in people. They invest in people. They know that the idea that you started with is not the idea you're going to end up with. <laughs> As you refine your business model, it will keep changing. When we started Ace Foods, our first product were going to be jams and pepper sauces. We actually won the business plan competition based on our jams and pepper sauces. Today, we don't produce either jams or pepper sauces. Our biggest product mixes are spices and seasonings. And, and people invested in us because they believe that we're people of integrity, people who will reinvent themselves, people who will respond to the changing times, people who will evolve. Um, and that by putting their money in us, they could trust us. Now, as you're also investigating in the Nigerian context who you should take money from, whether it's your uncle or brother, sister, you structure it, meaning you have a formal contract. You agree on the terms of the engagement. You agree on whether they get a board seat or not. And there's no direct link. They don't always need to get board seats. You agree on their exit. And if it's a loan or an equity investment, many people take these things for granted. They say, oh, it's my uncle. I've known him for a long time. I'll give him 50% of my company for 2 million Naira. What is the value of your company? How do you know that 50% is worth 2 million Naira? Um, so I've heard horror stories from people who have taken these things for granted. And then they take on very, very bad investors. And in one case, this investor actually has taken over my friend's company. And the investor is a thug, a thug in a suit. Because when you hear about the investor, you don't realize that the person is like, you know, celebrated in society, but is actually a thug. And so the challenge for us is, how are you structuring every aspect of your business? How, what systems and structures have you put in place to value your business? And in that sense, debt or equity, you've, you have to value them. You know, some types of investments, as I said, are expensive. I wouldn't, people have been approaching us to, to invest in our company and we've been like, no, no, for now we're not, we don't want any equity investors because we feel like debt is going to be a cheaper option for us now than equity. So you have to actually look at the, uh, 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 consider your options. And the most important thing in picking investors is values, 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 values of integrity, values. Is the person committed to helping you grow? Are they in this for the right reasons? How desperately do they need the money they're giving you? If they need that money, please don't take it from them. Because you need patient capital. Patient capital is people who will, are willing to wait. And in our case, you know, it was patient capital. So they can give you the money. And for the next 10 years, that money doesn't, they don't, they don't need it to eat or to pay their rent. And then you have to report. So on a quarterly basis, we send them reports on how the business is doing, where dividends are available. We give them dividends. So I think it's really important to manage those relationships because those are the people who will be with you in the next business. They will be with you. They'll be the ones talking you up. They'll be the ones um, screaming at the rooftops about how committed and how capable you are. And um, I, I just feel like some of us are too casual about our valuations and too casual about who we surround ourselves with. And we take it for granted that, you know, there's a difference between business is business, family is family, friends are friends. And everything has to be documented. If it is not documented, it did not happen. That's a rule. Every organization that I work in, if it wasn't recorded, it didn't happen. If it wasn't documented, it didn't happen. So keep that at the back of your mind. Wow.
that's 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 so insightful if it wasn't documented it didn't happen okay let's take one more question and then we move towards the questions that have to do more with scaling um the, uh, we uh, observe the trend amongst entrepreneurs giving preference to company registration you know overseas i mean like delaware rather than locally what, what benefits are credible for registrations done overseas as against locally why 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 do you think this this is is a, is a moving is a growing trend <laughs> and you do want to take that first and let's Sure, sure. Um, again, again, I feel like this is very, very specific to the technology industry. Okay. Um, and it's also specific to its own funding sources. So, okay. you know, like I said, you know, there are a few, a few um, organizations that can fund um, a technology business locally or understand the asset class. Okay. And so if you're an entrepreneur, and you want to build a, a, a business, um, you know, um, that, that is going to be looked upon favorably um, by, um, by funding sources in markets where um, that asset class is understood, you know, it makes sense for you to incorporate in Delaware. Um, okay. And so that's why entrepreneurs do it. In fact, to be very specific, People do it primarily because their first funding is coming from an investor who insists that they do so. Okay. <laughs> do you understand what I'm trying to say? So mm -hmm. it, it's, it's a very specific kind of situation with the tech industry where U.S. investors, by virtue of their, um, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, by virtue of their um, charters, um, we call it the LPA agreement, they're not allowed to invest outside of the US hmm. because they're taking money from US venture funds, venture funds and US that the US doesn't allow them to invest in companies outside of the US. Um, also, I mean, but but the long-term benefits, like you like you asked, you, ask, you know, um, the US is the deepest pool of capital in the world. Um, so you you obviously have that kind of access to capital. Um, also, I think if you're an honest entrepreneur, it is also one of the most difficult places to be a compliant business person because they don't play with their laws. You can get arrested <laughs> for doing things mm. in a funny way. So mm. surviving in an environment like that shows investors from all over the world that you have nothing to hide. Um, mm. And then obviously there are certain ease of doing business um, element to it. I mean, you can incorporate. If I start, if you tell me today you want to incorporate a Delaware company, uh, if you're willing to pay the right price, which is not more than two thousand dollars, I can have one ready for you by five o'clock today. Wow. Um, which, <laughs> which is not the case uh, with many other jurisdictions around the world. So I think that's what some people are looking at when they make that decision to invest in uh, uh, to go incorporate their companies in Delaware. Okay. Um, um, and did any take uh, from you? Yes. I would actually say that for my industry, you should not incorporate in Delaware. <laughs> if you're in the agriculture <laughs> and food sector and the real sector, please stay away from the U.S. Um, as someone who pays taxes in the U.S., I can tell you that, um, like e, e said, the compliance level is extremely high. Mm -hmm. The tax authorities will find you till the end of the earth. And... Um, you know, the requirements are very, very high. I think in the, in the Nigerian context, you have, you know, a lot more concessions for um, startups in this environment. Our tax regime okay. is, is um, strict and we do have multiple taxation in Nigeria, but it's, if okay. you add up all the taxes, it's still less than what you'll be paying in America. <laughs> Corporate <laughs> tax in America is, is quite high and uh, employee, you know, payee, what we call payee in Nigeria, employee right. tax is about 30%, 30 to 40%. Nigerians, compliant Nigerians, if you add everything, it's about 16%. So I'm just saying, let's think through the, what your business model is, what makes sense for you from an investor perspective. But if you're in the real sector uh, in Nigeria, I think it makes sense to incorporate in Nigeria. 
Great, thank you so much. All right, so let's let's um, look a bit more into the questions that have to do with um, um, established entrepreneurs who want to scale. And now there's a question and uh, that um, talks about how does a company get listed on an exchange, um, whether locally or offshore. What steps should be taken to nurture the company to that point? At what point does a company qualify to be listed, you know, on the on on the exchange? Just so that you know those who are have that as a long term strategy, you know, know you know, what to do and how they should be preparing, you know, towards, you know, moving their company to that stage. Um, um, Indithi, you want to take it up first? Sure. So I have not listed any companies on the exchange, but I've sat on boards of companies that are listed. I sit on the board of Nigerian Breweries. I used to sit on the board okay. of Nestle and Cornerstone Insurance. And okay. I'd say for starters, as an entrepreneur, you have to be ready to be exposed in ways you never imagined if you're going to be listed. So while the Nigerian Stock Exchange currently has this whole program uh, where they're trying to get SMEs listed, uh, being listed puts you under tremendous pressure around reporting, around um, your, your exposure in terms of your stock price and what drives the stock price and the market forces, as well as the regulatory environment from the NSC itself. So you have to be ready for that type of pressure and scrutiny. If you thought you already faced pressure before, you don't realize the type of pressure you'll be under, especially with the new regulatory environment that we've entered. That said, it's a good way to raise funding, right? If you feel like your company is big enough that you do want to go and raise external funding, it's a good way to do that. Uh, but this tremendous, tremendous pressure. And then you're going to need to put in place a lot of systems and structures that ordinarily you would not imagine, even in terms of who's on your board, your company secretary, um, to be a board member for these listed companies. I've had to take tests. Many of you will not know. I actually have written books on governance and boards, but I actually had to go and study for those tests because people fail. Wow. <laughs> people fail the test. <laughs> You have to, as a board member, you have to be, um, you know, you have to be one step ahead of it. So I would say in the Nigerian context, look at it, but do talk to companies that have listed um, and try to understand their experiences. There are other ways to take up, to raise external funding without listing. Hmm. Listing is a good option. And, and, and actually the stock exchange welcomes it right now. So if you go on their website, you'll see the whole initiative they have for SMEs that enables them to list. But I'll talk to E. Maybe he has a listed company that he can share. <laughs> e, can you tell us a bit more? <laughs> well, okay. I mean, just there, there are kind of two elements to it, in my opinion. Um, first of all is, um, do you look like a listed company? And then the second thing is really kind of the specific processes that you have to take to, 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 be, to be listed. For generally speaking, um, I mean, I also have not listed a company. However, I've helped some companies list. Um, um, or advice on companies that are listing. And I also sit on the board of a listed company in Nigeria. So I've been able to kind of see how it works from behind the scenes. Um, I think the first, and, and also I have both, both companies that, that I've found that have considered listing at some point. And may, it may be in one or two of their plans at some point in the future. So I've started on board meetings where this is a priority for the management. Um, so, I mean, the, 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 so the first thing is really, you know, does your company look like a listed company, right? So the, the first key thing is um, 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 what, what we call um, um, your revenues have to be extremely predictable. I, I apologize, sorry. Um, predictable revenue, right? So like, what does your predictable revenue look like? Um, so, because um, listed companies don't really have a lot of room for, um, they don't have a lot of room for like um, variance, so to speak. You can't just be spiking up and down. There's a, there's a level of predictability you have to have in your revenues for you to be considered listed. Then your executive team, are they people who have had experience um, because just like in the dimension, you're going to have to report things a specific way, manage things a specific way. You have to have very clear processes. Um, you have to look a certain way to be listed in terms of your executive team, particularly your CFO, right? Has to be somebody who has that experience of reporting um, for a listed company. This is extremely important. Um, the third, the third uh, thing element of that is really um, thinking carefully about the interest of your investors, right? So um, 
obviously the reason why people list is because they want to raise external capital but nowadays that's less the reason usually it's because they want to provide liquidity to your investors and to your employees um there are certain kinds of investors who have um a huge leg up when it comes to preparing people uh, companies for listing and you probably want to get those type of investors as close to the finish line as possible right so you know the likes of tpg are uh, very well versed in helping companies list. Uh, the likes of Helios have done a really good job of helping companies who want to list. So you want to think carefully about bringing on those type of investors to kind of help you and beat you up into the shape where it makes sense for you to list. Um, and then obviously you have to identify the process itself is, uh, is, is fairly long winded and it will take some time. But what happens typically is that first of all, um, you have to determine where you want to list. So you can decide you want to list in Nigeria. Um, the, like like Antinidi said, the NSC has good programs, but there are also other programs that you can leverage. Like um, you know, you, there, there's also there are other pro, there are other programs. It's, it's fine. It's I have to turn off my videos. Sorry. No, no, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> Okay, while um, he tries to take care of uh, domestic issues, let's just, let's just quickly move on. Um, there, there, there is another interesting um, um, insight when you look into the business climate in, this, in, in Nigeria, and I'd just quickly like to um, ask you the question, Indidi. There are very few multi-generational businesses within this environment. When we say multi-generational, you see businesses that are handed over from father to son, son to son, grandson, and things like that. And you know, though our cultural values around family you know, family is, is uh, you know, is, is quite strong. Uh, we do not see this cascaded into the business environment like we see in other climes, like in Europe, in Asia, and things like that. Well, what, what do you think is responsible for this trend, and how can we change this narrative where businesses, you know, transcend, you know, the, the those who started them and are handed down, you know, 30, 40, 50 years, as the case may be. What, what's, what do you think? Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Thank you so much for that question. One of the reasons I started Leap Africa was exactly because of this reason. In 1997, as a, a first year student at Harvard Business School, I got a magazine in my box that said 100 Indian companies over 100 years old. And I started thinking about Nigeria, even the whole continent of Africa, and I couldn't think of 100 companies that were over 100 years old. And the truth is most companies globally die with their founders, most. Um, only 30% of global, global companies survive until the second generation, and the third generation is even lower. And the, ch the reason for that, uh, after we did the research, and we've now written two books about it, please go and get those books, entrepreneurs. The first one is called Defying the Odds, Case Studies of Nigerian Companies that Have Survived Generations. And the second one is called Passing the Baton, and these are written by Leap Africa. Um, and I'll type them into the the uh, chat box. Now, what did we find? We found that number one, a lot of entrepreneurs don't think about succession. You have to think about succession the day you start your company. The day you start your company, think about when you're going to step out. And you don't need to step out when you're old and gray. You need to step out when you're tired, when you're bored, when your skills are no longer relevant, or when you're being called by God to do something else which means you have to have people willing and able to take over from you. Now, many of us don't think about succession. And any successful business has to think about succession from day one because anything can happen. When I started Leap Africa, four years in, my husband got shot and I had to leave the country really suddenly. The board members stepped in to take care of that company. And that's the second thing, beyond having a succession plan is having a strong board. One of the board members, Dr. Nadu Deloye, actually played a role, started coming into the company three days a week for free to stabilize the company. If we did not have that board, Leap Africa would have died. Today, Leap Africa is 18 years old and works in six African countries. I don't run it anymore. It has, it's on its third succession and I sit on the board. I'm not even the board chair. So we have proven that in the Nigerian context, you can build companies that will survive you. If something happened to me today, Leap will continue because I'm no longer running it day to day. And that's what we have to think about is the first, having a succession plan. Second, having a strong governance structure. Third, putting in place systems and structures that don't revolve around you. Yesterday, E and I were on a conversation 
about institutions and building institutions in Nigeria. And I said that why institutions are so weak in Nigeria is because they revolve around individuals. No institution that revolves around an individual will succeed. We need institutions that revolve around a business idea, an, a, a business concept. And we need uh, institutions that can, uh, if, if indeed he's not there, you know, many of us, and we'll be honest, if we run businesses that our customers say, if, if indeed he's not there, I don't want to deal with you. Um, if, if, where is Olga? And, and in my own context, even with my consulting firm, I've made it clear that if you cannot deal with other senior leadership, then you don't, you don't want to do business with us because I am not going to be on every single project. And now we have an Abuja office um, and we've expanded, right? And I'm not in the Abuja office, but the Abuja office is running really well. And it's because the systems are structured. And then the last thing I'll say is values. You know, we don't define our values as entrepreneurs. We, some of us have mission statements, vision statements, but we haven't thought about values. Values are non-negotiable. I want every organization I've started to have the same values. I'll use an example. One value I have is that I have all the organizations I've started are meritocracies. You know what a meritocracy is? You move up based on merits, right? So one way that we dispel that myth, everybody calls me Ndidi. Even the driver, everybody calls me Ndidi. Do you understand? And so if you come in and you're maybe 50 years old, you're a factory manager, they will call you by your first name, Femi. And if you don't like to be called by your first name, you can't work in my companies. Why? Because we're trying to show that really there's no difference between someone who's 50 and someone who's 20. It's about what you deliver, what ideas you're bringing to the table. And that's so uncomfortable for some people. They come in and they're like, these young people calling me by my first name. Some of them could be my children. I'm like, ah, in this company, all of us are the same. We are on the same level. We are peers. And we're going to treat each other with respect. Nobody's carrying your bag from the car to come into the office. Do you understand? That meritocracy, those values, I'm just using meritocracy as an example. Integrity, zero tolerance for bad behavior. If you lie, you're out. If you steal, you're out. So if that's, those are values that are passed down from generation five, generations later, those values survive the test of time. And so for me, you have to be deliberate. Please get the book, Passing the Baton and Defying the Odds. And in all those books, we talk about punch newspapers. Punch newspapers have survived very sudden deaths of their founder. They still survive till today. You know, that's an example. Even 7-Up Bottling Company. I mean, there are practical stories that people shared about their challenges building companies that have outlived their founders. But they're amazing stories, even in the Nigerian context. <laughs> So be inspired by the examples of others to put in place the systems and structures to make sure that your company outlives you. Okay. Hello. <laughs> Sorry. Hello, I'm back, but I, I missed that question. Part of it, I, I had to just, uh, I had to manage uh, not, not a right. problem. Okay. No. Did you want me to continue where I stopped, or do you? We can just move on if, if you want. Oh, however, no. you want. To do. No, we uh, could we could just we could just move on. Uh, but but let me ask the question um, that um, indeed he has just responded to in a little different way, so you can give your yeah. perspective to it. So we we we've seen you know in the last ten years or more a lot of mergers and acquisitions, you know, and um, it's been an obvious trend now for entrepreneurs to start, grow and sell their business or stakes in the business and move on to something else. And, and um, um, we were, we're still talking about businesses that transcend one generation to another. How do you see that this, this new approach affecting uh, um, that whole um, trend? Um, uh, and also what, at what point is it necessary for someone to, um, to, hand over their businesses and move on to something else at what point? So maybe you might have some experience because of a bit of your background and haven't moved on a bit and, and, and around how, what, what, at what point do you decide to do that? Yeah. And, and how do you see that affecting multi-generational businesses? Yeah, I think, I think it's important for businesses to become institutions as quickly as, as possible. So I, I'm particularly brutal <laughs> in this respect. I leave my businesses, uh, I have a timeline of 36 months for any business I be, I, I start. Um, and I start counting from the day I enter. I have a resignation letter always in my inbox and I set a bunch of milestones. 
um, within which uh, I must leave the business. Because, I mean, the way I think about it, you know, anything that has a beginning must have an end, right? That's how we keep things sustainable. Um, and what also helps me quite a bit is the fact that our businesses are very institutionalized by virtue of venture capital. So, you know, because there's a lot of people with capital in the business, um, you know, they, they, they're incentivized to basically ensure that the business continues to go on, uh, irregardless of what circumstantial uh, issues happen. Um, an aspect in the sense that I always start, have teams ready um, to, to take over. Um, I have leadership ready to take over as soon as possible once certain milestones have, have hit. For me, the decision that I make in terms of, uh, in terms of um, uh, when it's time for me to, to do that, um, to, to leave the company is really a couple of things. Number one, um, you know, is my specific expertise required in that company? And I ask myself that question the moment that I can take a three month uh, or any, if, if quote unquote vacation, because you never really stop working longer than six weeks without the company going into any serious crisis, right? Mm. So I typically take a long, a long study leave, quote unquote, before I leave the company so that I test whether the company actually does need me to be there on a day to day. Uh, the second question I ask is, is do they have enough resources um, to weather whatever storms are going to so I make sure, you know, both companies, whoever my successor was, had to be able to architect the firm as he wanted. Um, and then finally, you know, the question is, um, 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 elsewhere. I'm a very young person. Um, I'm not even 30 yet. I tried to retire. It didn't work for me. So <laughs> I, I realized that there's an opportunity cost to my time because I was the owner or the founder. And, that, um, and oftentimes I have to weigh that. Um, it's really important. It's extremely important. Does your successor have the resources to be successful, right? If not, you should stay on and make sure they do. And then the third thing is obviously, you know, what's the opportunity cost of sitting where you are, you know, instead of, of transitioning to something new. Um, and you know, I'm sure God would also speak to us because it's a very spiritual decision, the decision to leave. Uh, for many people, especially in our culture, uh, the expectation is that it's your company, right? How can you leave? <laughs> but, there's no, but I think when you look at these things as assignments, you know, it's just like the church of God. Um, there's no, I hate it when people call it a church. You know, I go to Foursquare. Our church is a very constitutional church. So from a very early age, we've been told, we might be no own church, right? It's only God. So anytime it's... You understand? When you go, some people to it, they have a sense. Um, these are institutions to remain from generation to generation. Great. Okay. Um... Let, let's talk about affiliations, franchises, and, um, and um, white labeling, okay? Um, given the prospect of our markets and environment, I mean, we see an influx of foreign players coming into this market. What's your opinion on collaboration, affiliations, and franchises? I mean, yes, we have people who, who, who have ideas, we have people who are already in, in businesses, but there, there are also opportunities for affiliations, franchises, for those who are not in this market. Um, white labeling of products or solutions, as the case may be. What, what's your opinion about, you know, those approaches for entrepreneurs for launching, you know, as regards to entrepreneurs who want to, you know, get into that space? And did you? So I would really say it depends on what your motivation is. Remember, we said that you have to come in wanting to solve a problem or to create value. Mm -hmm. um, and I would say that people have had mixed experiences with franchises. Um, uh, some people very positive and some people very negative. 
because there's a, a startup franchise fee you have to pay. And there are quite a few requirements around buying inputs, buying products, buying services, and then obviously profit sharing. And as an entrepreneur, you have to look at the full spectrum. You know, it, it hurts me. I was reflecting on this the other day that about 15 years ago, a, a Stanford professor came to Nigeria and she said, I love Mr. Biggs. Their meat pie is so amazing. She said, you guys should take this as a franchise model all over Africa and to the United States. Mm. Um, today, Mr. Biggs, I don't know. I don't even know if I've seen a Mr. Biggs recently. And yet we see in our backyard, we see Domino's, we see KFC. Um, and that makes me very, very sad because I feel like we've missed out on opportunities to actually create brands that we can franchise to the rest of the world. And um, brands that, uh, we, you know, where it's a reverse type of relationship. And so what I would suggest, and, and you know, the truth is, if you ask Mr. Biggs, I mean, they might even say that it was the franchising that, that hurt their growth. I'll let them tell their story. Um, because a lot of people who get into these businesses don't really on the, get in for the right reasons. Um, you know, so you have to be very clear about your rationale, um, how restrictive some of these uh, partnerships are, what is in it for you, the break-even points, and your own assessment of the market. I know many people have said they want to bring in McDonald's into Nigeria, they want to bring in Starbucks into Nigeria, and I often say that you are appealing to, uh, um, you know, 1% uh, uh, of the population who values and understands those brands. Meanwhile, there are vast opportunities for us to displace imports in so many other spectrums. And so I would like us to reframe our mindset and say, what can we source locally that we can provide for this local market? And I think this is a unique time for Nigerian entrepreneurs. So I didn't, I just tell you a quick story. I mentioned that our business model was supposed to start with jams and pepper sauces because i used to see tabasco sauce everywhere i'd go to restaurants in lagos and i'll see tabasco sauce i don't know if any of you have tasted tabasco sauce but yeah. it's the most awful thing ever i hate it right and yet we have the best pepper in nigeria we have so many types of pepper red pepper chili pepper in nigeria and i was wondering why can't we make tomato uh, pepper sauce that we can you know export that we can displace all the restaurants in Nigeria that have Tabasco. And guess what? Yes, restaurants were like, no, 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 we prefer Tabasco. We're not gonna buy your pepper sauce. But then we started going to companies and asking them, what is it that you're importing? And they told us spices. So guess what? We shifted from our year one strategy to our year three strategy. And now we supply spices in bulk, 25 kg sacks to companies that were importing the spices who are now sourcing proudly Nigerian products. And during this COVID-19, some of the people who refused to buy from us, who are still importing spices, are now buying from us because the Naira is devalued, they can't clear the products, um, and we're experiencing significant growth in demand. And so I will challenge every entrepreneur to think locally. What can you source locally? What are we importing that we need to produce here? Um, and how can we change the landscape so that people are, want our franchises instead of the other way around? But I'm sure EE e has a different response. Well, EE, e, let's hear uh, your response. Well, I mean, I actually, funny enough, I share your thoughts, Auntie, um, especially when it comes to franchises. I just feel like in Nigeria, they don't quite work because they require an understanding of, um, uh, of, the, of, like, of the brand by the local environment. Um, what often ha ends up happening with a lot of... Um, with a lot of entrepreneurs is that they end up subsidizing marketing for these global brands in the name of franchising. But I think it's also important that we think about global connections and global alliances, um, primarily from two different angles. Number one, um, if we want to export, right, we need to start thinking about trust. It's a very important aspect of export, exporting. And we have to be honest, it's very, very difficult to build trust in a Nigerian brand these days, right? So there might be some sense in doing that if you're exporting, because you're exporting to a brand that is well known. Um, on, and so for, for, for partnerships, I would always say, look at it from that perspective. The other side of it is also that if there's some sort of technical expertise that, um, 
that is lacking locally, and there is quite a bit um, in many respects, right? Um, it might make sense for you to partner with a global um, giant who can fill that gap. Um, and, and, you know, that was one thing I've definitely realized with Andela. We had a number of partnerships with global um, companies and global learning companies, and that really helped our growth um, as, a, as, a, as, a, uh, as a company. So I think it's, it's very much like what Ansi said, which is, you know, how are you thinking about um, the decision to franchise? How are you thinking about the decisions to partner? What is in it um, for, for you? What gap are they filling for you? Right. If it's just simply to say uh, as a reputational thing, there's smarter ways to do it. Don't do it in such a way that you're subsidizing or marketing the company locally at your own expense. Right. Globally, I can see a very good case for it. If you want to build trust um, um, in, in a product globally, it might be necessary for you to work with a global brand um, to be able to do so. OK, wow. Really insightful. Um, so, so we're going to touch on a few more questions because we're, I mean, time is moving so, 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 so fast. But it's been so, so, um, so much of learning actually. Um, let's let's quickly take this question and E. I'll come back to you again on this one. I mean, um, um, uh, indeed, he had alluded to it earlier on um, about um, leveraging technology uh, when she answered the question around uh, ideation earlier on. Um, we see there are a lot of tech based businesses, you know, currently and. Um, what they call digital natives. And they're becoming the order of the day and entrepreneurs have been encouraged to explore this route because even as a result of the pandemic, physical contact is further de-emphasized. In your opinion, what are the critical success factors for such organizations and how should they scale? So, you know, you're a digital native. I mean, so how, how do you, um, now you, I mean, just having your platform online and how do you scale, well, you know, if that's the type of business that you run, you know, uh, um, as an entrepreneur? Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, well, first of all, I think it's important to understand why a lot of people are pushing on this digital narrative um, so that you know why, you, <laughs> why you're being encouraged in that direction. Um, okay. And I think it really revolves around uh, barriers to entry. When you okay. think about the kind of business that Auntie Ndidi does, it's for serious people. I'm not saying my business is not for serious people, but I mean, <laughs> Buying a factory is not uh, something that you just think about in your apartment and you get, you get to it, right? You right. need to be somebody that, that is a serious person. Um, very different from maybe an app that does delivery or something like that, you know? Mm. Very different set of concerns, very different set of um, requirements, very different set of um, 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 considerations that you're going to make. Uh, however, what it ultimately ends up as is that the barrier to entry with any other kind of business is much, much lower than okay. the barriers to entry um, 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 with tech. Hmm. Uh, um, sorry, the barriers to entry with tech, tech are much, much lower. lower than barriers to entry yeah. with other businesses. Hmm. That said, yeah, tech is lower. Um, so that said, I mean, when you're thinking about tech, as a business, uh, bringing technology and innovation into your business. I think it's helpful to think about, as we keep repeating, what problem you're trying to solve, and also what kind of problems technology can help you solve. I find a lot of people don't think about the same problems. So for example, right, right? how do I sell pepper? I have unlimited supply of pepper. But how do I get pepper in the hands of 10,000 homes across Lagos, right? The traditional pepper seller in the market can only sell to people who come to the market. Do you understand what I'm saying? Right. Um, the, 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 they, they cannot sell to 10,000 homes, no matter how much supply they have. Do you understand what I'm saying? Right. However, uh, somebody who is selling pepper online, right? And sell to 10,000 homes because it's simply a function of how many people are able to get on their phone and order the pepper to their house and pay for it. Get out of their house, go to the market. If everybody in the market was coming, you understand what I'm saying? So technology example to use might be banking, for example. I always use this joke. There are about 4,000 
I mean, I think I, I, when I did a survey um, for my last church growth um, retreat, um, we realized that um, I think we had more church branches and house fellowship centers than banks, than there were bank branches in, in Nigeria, wow. right? <laughs> right? So there are only about 5,000 bank branches in Nigeria. We have about 4,500 churches. And then maybe if you had house fellowship centers, you, you'd be getting to about 8,000 points of service, right? Um, banks are roughly about five, uh, sorry, banks are roughly about five, uh, 5,000, right? If you look at there are about 33 million registered bank account holders in Nigeria with DVN, unique bank account holders, right? Mm -hmm. If all those 33 million people went to the bank, eh, how many years would it take them to get served? <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever thought about it like that? Right, right. Right, if you, dis if you divide them equally, 3 million, and don't forget to most of these banks are in Lagos. About 75% of these banks are in Lagos, hmm. right? Bank branches are in Lagos, they're not anywhere else in the country. So, that just gives you an example of where technology can then step in with financial inclusion to ensure that the 33 million people don't have to cram themselves into 5,000 branches hmm. that are not very big in the first place in order to get banking access to banking services. Hmm. So when, why, why do I say this? I say this to make the point that as we think about our business, we need to think about technology in the context of helping us solve size and scale challenges, scale. right? Mm. We shouldn't think about technology as a be all end all. It should be a platform for growing our business. Now, in terms of practical steps, I will always advise to people, my advice to people is building technology is a complex process. Building good technology is even more complex try and leverage platforms. It's not the kind of uh, investment that an individual should be making. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. Mm. It really is not. So I see a lot of small businesses, they say they want to go and do e-commerce sites. That's nice. But I would always say, look, before you truly, truly understand whether or not your customers require from you an e-commerce site, why not leverage Jumia? Why not leverage all the stores? There's Pista Commerce there's Slaughter Witch stores. There's so many different platforms that you can use. You understand what I'm trying to say? Right, you should right. only leverage technology if you have a skill and distance challenge that technology can help you solve. So that's how to think about it. Wow, that's, that's, that's so insightful. It should be for, for scaling you know okay um so because of time and i, I think we're already at 1 30 and we just have 30 more minutes and we still have a lot of questions but let's see if we can you know increase our pace as fast as possible um right. I, I want to touch on i want to touch on you know softer issue uh on 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 one side and uh, i i want to i, I want to need to help us with this this um before any chips in um so we we're, we're, uh, the question goes thus it says that how should an entrepreneur navigate the growth phase um um the growth phase and manage the competence of the team for the next phase versus loyalty so let's say an organization is, is going into its next phase and the competency of the team you know would not fit with what is required for that phase um how do we manage you know this the team um vis-a-vis -vis loyalty especially if some of these team members in question were foundational staff how do you how do you navigate through such a softer issue let's let's hear you mm -hmm. it's a great question it's a great question i have been reading a lot about managing teams and i read a book called the um, team player and it okay. says there are three three things you need in uh, amazing team members the first one is hunger the second is humility and the third is emotional intelligence okay. hunger humility and emotional intelligence and the truth is when we think about our organization and our staff and actually if we plot our staff against these three very simple indicators we'll find out that the best performers are hungry they are humble and they have emotional intelligence okay and when we consider our team members we have to consider them within the current phase of the organization and the future phase of the organization and what i say as a christian is that sometimes i have to exit people into their destiny <laughs> <laughs> 
So it's a very difficult decision. But you're exiting them into their destiny, meaning they're not supposed to be in your organization, but you're going to give them the support they need to move on to the next level. Hmm. So one of the things I do religiously at Sahel is that I invest in training my people. And I'm not just training them for my purposes, I'm training them for their future. Many people are not going to grow with the organization, but you can help them find their life's purpose and you can help them move into the next phase of their development outside your organization. But you have to be ruthless as an entrepreneur so to surround yourself with mission-driven high achievers who are hungry, who are humble, and who have emotional intelligence. Otherwise, you're going to pull your hair out. I have a rule, and people think I'm tough, but I have a rule. If I come, if I lose sleep for three nights because of you, you can't be on my team. <laughs> <laughs> I'm literally not sleeping because of something you've done or not done that has set us back. And a reputation can be destroyed in five minutes, a reputation of 10 years, because a, a team member you invested in, you believed in, destroyed that reputation. So I, um, I definitely, please, do not sacrifice loyalty or do not put loyalty over competence. Or, and I didn't even say skills. Remember the three things I talked about? I didn't talk about skills. I said hunger. If they're hungry enough, they will build the skills. If they're humble enough, they will learn. They will position themselves to do whatever it takes to, to, to achieve the mission and objectives of the organization. If they have emotional intelligence, they know how to work with others. So loyalty for me, is great, but you can be loyal and supportive of me outside the organization. <laughs> and I'll, I'll help you do that. So that's my response. I don't know if E has a different one. E, e let's, let's, let's put a question okay. to you. This, let's, let's, let's put a question to you to, this way. Uh, what's, what's, what are non-negotiables for you when you're building teams? Because I know you talked about having a great team earlier on today. What are non-negotiables for you when building teams? I mean, I'll be very honest with you. I think maybe because I'm in a different phase of my life from Auntie, um, okay. I'm a bit stuck on the loyalty question, yeah? Okay. <laughs> so I find loyalty um, extremely. I think okay. mostly because um, I think my, my own point of view um, with respect to the people who help you build organizations is that there's a place for everybody, right? Mm. Um, um, obviously, there's a need to bring in um, competent people, um, but I find that oftentimes just being able to have competent people who are driven by things that may not necessarily be um, um, always uh, uh, the same as what you care about um, is not enough. Um, I've, I've, I've found a lot of organizations mission drift as a result of competence. Uh, it's not about competence or just competence, right? Okay. Um, just, you know, people are doing their jobs, but in doing their jobs, um, they're robbing people of, of, of um, they rob the organization of soul, quote unquote. It's a more softer issue. So for me, I think the number one thing when I'm looking for team members is a dedication to mission, right? Mm -hmm. Literally, um, in the earlier stages of my businesses, I make people live in the same house that's how inane I am <laughs> about dedication to mission. Like you leave your house and you live with me. We need to be able to spend a lot of time together and be as passionate about what we're pushing forward um, as everybody else. Um, I prize that over even competence. I prize that even above, to some extent, loyalty to me because loyalty to me is not even important to me, but loyalty to the mission is extremely important. That you care about the customers that we are, working with and that okay. you understand what's at stake with serving them is extremely important to me. Um, the second thing that I appreciate is a learning culture, right? So if I see improvements every day, if I work with you, I can, I'm actually pretty forgiving of mistakes because my experience has been, I guess I also been it because I'm young. Um, most things can be fixed to be very honest, right? Especially if intention is not, um, is not completely lost in that omission, so to speak, or in commission, right? If the person's heart is in the right place, uh, most of those issues can be fixed. And obviously, there is obvious, I'm looking for them not to make that same mistake again, right? Mm. <laughs> That's the most important thing. And then the, 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 the last thing I look for in my team members um, is um, I really like underdogs. I really like people who people, other people have said, 
you you don't uh, you don't you you don't have you're disqualified from doing this because of something. I I I really appreciate um, identifying talent with potential, uh, perhaps even more so than 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 I appreciate um, working with, uh, with with talent that already knows what they're doing. Now that's not to say I don't. I wouldn't hire talent that doesn't already know what they're doing. Um, but what I've done in my own organizations, um, at least the ones I ran directly, is that I, I'll bring them in as advisors. I'll bring them in as, um, I'll bring them in as um, senior managers for, on a contract. Um, but I love to build teams with a lot of room to grow. And that will grow with me. I mean, the people I've worked with in my companies have been with me for 10 years. And they're my age. So we've all grown old together. Um, <laughs> so I, I prefer I prefer that, um, and I'm I'm usually very wary uh, of uh, sometimes of bringing in uh, alpha alpha people onto my teams that have no loyalty to me or to the mission and have what I call the wrong type of ambition, uh, which is an ambition for personal achievement as opposed to for mission and loyalty okay. to the mission. Okay. It kind of ties in actually with what uh, Indidi said about being hungry, because I mean, if you if you if you're actually an underdog or you've been told before that you know you're not you're probably a never do well in that area, you probably would want to prove a point, and of course you would throw yourself into it. Okay, let's let's look at something um, um, a little different, but um, I think it's critical. Yeah, it's a little critical um, um, in today's uh, for the today's entrepreneur um, entrepreneur and within this um, environment. Let's look at data. Uh, so there is there is the saying that data is a new currency, data is a new oil, right? So what are the imperatives for data in our environment that is rapidly moving towards digital, even though data seems to be unavailable and where available it is fragmented? Can you, can you tell us a bit about what you think about that? Yeah, so one of the reasons I started Nourishing Africa, which is an online digital business, is this issue of data. So every other day, people would write me and say, Ndidi, I need data on rice farming. Ndidi, I need data on maize farming. And I saw someone who says he needs information on snail farming. And so I realized that with Sahel, we were collecting all this data all over Africa, and we needed to put it somewhere, but that there was also data available that people couldn't find. So what we've created is an online hub called nourishingafrica.com. If you're interested in agriculture and food, um, even if you're a caterer, a chef, um, a retailer, please go on nourishingafrica.com, upload your profile and become a member. You'll start getting a lot of support, not just in terms of data, but training and access. Um, and you leverage this to build your business or to start a new business. And it's a free online portal. So I'm, I'm marketing it uh, unashamedly today. But beyond that, what I realized is that all of us entrepreneurs have data. And the question is, how are you using your data? I'll give an example. I'm sure there are people on this platform. Somebody has written that she has a school, right? So she has data. She doesn't realize she has data. She has data, not just on how, when people pay for school fees, how old their children are, when their children were born, what other schools their children have gone to, she has data. If you're someone who makes cakes, you have data. You have data on when I've bought your cakes in the past and what I put on the cakes so that you'll know whether my children's birthday was last week or whether my wedding anniversary is next week. And many of us don't mind this data. We don't mind this data first to assess our customers, to understand how to better engage them, to understand how to serve them. I mean, it blows my mind that all the people I buy cakes from not one sends me a message saying, we know a birthday is coming up. Do you want to place an order? Not one, not one. Imagine if they did, they would be my, that loyalty would be for life. I love my sister who has Eventful. Many of you follow Eventful. Many of you follow um, my other sister who has Zafire. She recognizes the anniversaries of all of our customers. She has mined that data for every wedding she remembers. It's one year anniversary, two year anniversary, three year anniversary. You can mine data before you even talk about big data, which I'll leave to E. You can mine data to improve your operations, to reduce your costs, to engage with your suppliers, to interface with stakeholders across the ecosystem. And many of us waste this data. So my first advice to you entrepreneurs is, what are you doing with the data you have? I'm not even asking you to sell that data. What are you doing with it? 
how are you leveraging it to improve your operations, to improve your um, approach, to improve the resilience of your business? And what are you going to do differently once you start looking at that data on a monthly basis, on a weekly basis, on a quarterly basis to change course? Um, and I'll leave E to talk about um, big data, but I'll say E, my philosophy around people is not very different from yours. After you explained yours, I actually thought that was very similar. <laughs> so it's, it's really important. I was, yeah. I, 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 um, <laughs> I think it's very similar, but the, 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 it's just the nomenclature that we've used that's a bit different. All right, but let me um, let you take on the second part. Yeah, so Fantastic. Go ahead. Um, right. Yeah, so I mean, I think, I think as I said, everything that needs to be said about data. And whenever we're talking about big data, we have to first of all start by talking about small data, because at the end of the day, that's the level at which most people would actually use it. Um, but I think it bears uh, repeating um, that, you know, the, the reality of the way the world works is that um, data helps us to allocate resources. That's really what, what you know, at the end of the day, that, that's a summary of, uh, of the issue. Data helps us to allocate resources. By the time you understand at a deep level, right, who your customer is today, it makes it easier for you to also find people like them. Business is as simple as serving somebody today because the chances that they're going to have the same problems, the same approach to solving the problems, the same thought process about solving the problems is very, very high. Mm. So rather than just mm. shooting a miss when it comes to our marketing or you know doing a lot of things that may not make sense, just being able to mine that small data will give us a sense of where other customers like them are. And there are fantastic tools that people can teach you how to use, like Facebook audience tools, um, like Google AdWords, where you can now leverage that against the big data that these companies have to then identify customers exactly like the people you're currently selling to already, who are already finding value in the, pro in the, in the, in the, um, in the projects that, uh, in, in the, and finding the products that you're selling today. So it's very critical for you to actually have an understanding of how data directly translates to value in your organization. Another thing I like to say is that data predicts future behavior in interesting ways. So one of the things I like to do actually is um, whenever I do my performance appraisals um, for my staff, I like to go back and identify where I got that person from. I started that habit at Adela, where I used to rank my top, the schools where I got my top performing um, um, fellows, right, where they graduated from, and then go make sure I visit those schools um, to make sure I can get more people exactly like them, or better understand why I have people, uh, I have people of that, of that kind of that's you know hue from that directed ways to get talent um i remember because they would actually give you great products <laughs> you know what i mean yes. and i would tell those professors please any great students you have please send uh my way um so i think we don't do enough of that feedback looping um in our data um where we leverage the data that we have today to understand okay what what exactly was it that i did that created this good outcome and then do more of it? What exactly was it that I did to create this bad outcome and then avoid it? So I think those two things are extremely important for people to take note of. But data is critical to any kind of business. resource allocation for business today. Absolutely. Thank you so, so much. Okay, let's, let's touch on something a little closer to Indidi's heart. Uh, let's talk about social entrepreneurship. So, so, so this is the question, actually. Uh, we know that in our environment, we have, we have several challenges. You know, I mean, we're plagued with several challenges. And of course, we obviously even need more entrepreneurs to, to look into that space and effect you know, changes you know, and, and make impacts, okay? Uh, but how does an entrepreneur manage the fine line between achieving social impact and remaining profitable? Or keeping that that um, that um, um, social entrepreneur um, um, 
enterprise afloat as a company? Indy, we'd like to really learn from you because I mean, you have that, that experience. So I think in Nigeria, many, many companies are social enterprises, whether they choose to see themselves as social enterprises or not. Um, okay. The woman who wrote in the chat box who says she has a school, it's a for-profit, but a school is a social enterprise. If that school is committed to social change, that's making a difference in the lives of millions of people. Now, the challenge for social innovators, uh, as social entrepreneurs, is whether they can also be called social innovators. So what's the distinction? So because she owns a school, she is trying to make a difference, improve the lives of young people, help them find their purpose, equip them with their skills. But is she an innovator? An innovator is finding new ways of solving these problems to reach more people, millions of people. And that's what's really gonna differentiate a social entrepreneur versus a social innovator in terms of success. And that missing link is how you constantly reinventing your product or services to meet the changing times. I'll give you an example. When I wrote my book, Social Innovation in Africa, I interviewed an entrepreneur in Kenya who has an early childhood education, social innovation. And what does he do? He hires people in the community, right? To, so they have little schools set up almost like Bridge International Academies. And they have mamas in the community who provide daycare services for the children. But what is innovative about them? You can pay on a daily basis. So you drop your child, you pay that day, 1,000 Naira. That completely changes the model. Or you pay 100 Naira. And I just thought to myself, why aren't Nigerians setting up similar things in markets all over Nigeria? You know, markets all over Nigeria or near factories that don't have uh, crashes all over the country where women can take their child, drop their child and pay per day. Because most of us are charging per month. We're charging per quarter. So we say, oh, we don't trust Nigerians. They won't pay. Guess what? They have to pay when they're dropping off that child. They will pay, right? every single day. And so what right. they saw, it opened up a whole ecosystem around people who just needed place to keep their child every single day and who were earning daily wages and who couldn't afford to pay on a monthly basis. So for me, a social enterprise has to become an innovation hub where you're constantly redefining your business model and you're looking at ways you can leverage technology, payment systems, to appeal to the masses of people. Because what we don't realize is that the poor actually pay more for most products and services than the rest of the middle class and upper middle class because they have to pay on a daily basis. And our, our electricity is not provided on a daily basis. Our education, there's nothing that we've done to be able to offer fragmented or payment systems for this population. And I think there's so much opportunity for housing, around water, around sanitation. Around, we haven't even scratched the surface of the potential social innovations that can emerge in our ecosystem if we, re, re, we, we change our mindset around how we interface with the lowest income populations that we live with on a daily basis. Great, okay, so, so um, we have just, I think, barely 10, 11 minutes, so we have just two more questions, and of course, um, I'd like to get you know, the, um, your responses from both of you, because I think they are critical questions that um, um, affect entrepreneurs and, and everybody who is in that space today. So the pandemic has mandated a significant number of companies to create new safety measures for staff, including work from, from home options. This has further, you know, blurred the, the line between work and life balance, as the case may be. So, Indidi, let me start with you as a wife, a mother, an entrepreneur. How have you managed to juggle these roles without anything falling through the cracks? Um, we're coming to you also, too, but let's take it from, from um, uh, for at least from Indidi, for all of the female folks, for entrepreneurs, you, you, you wear all of those caps. It's, I mean, you're, you're wearing a multi, your cap is, is multicolored, actually. So how have you juggled all of this? And of course, no, nothing, fall, uh, um, uh, nothing has fallen through the cracks. Just, just a bit of advice. I have to be honest, it's been extremely difficult. This has been probably one of the toughest times. Uh, and for every entrepreneur, you need to pat yourself on the back, that you're still alive, that you're still standing, that you're still paying your staff. I want to applaud you. Um, for your fantastic contributions. 
Um, but the, that said, I think a lot of us don't ask for help. We don't ask for help. I have to applaud e, E's wife for ensuring that he is helping with the childcare today. Um, and to applaud <laughs> E for changing mindsets, right? That yes, a man, a child can be crying for their father and the mom doesn't have to rush to take care. Mm -hmm. We have to ask for help. I think my sisters out there, we are carrying such a burden trying to be perfect moms and we don't ask for help. And so I have become more vulnerable than ever before to ask for help. And some days I say to the people, I'm not entering the kitchen today. You guys just take care of yourselves. And guess what? I'm not any less of a woman because I just can't be perfect and do everything at the same time. Ask for help. Your spouse is there. You have family, your children. You know, this, this period, we actually decided that for, us, for health reasons, we wouldn't have uh, anybody coming to help us in the house. Mm -hmm. And it was extremely difficult, right? Because I worked 24 hours a day. But it meant that my children had to step up. And right. it wasn't easy, right? But guess what? It's the best gift I've given them this, this uh, COVID. is teaching them how to, you know, do what they need to do to live in society. And so, much of, so many of us are protecting our children from the harsh realities that they're going to face out there and we're raising spoiled brats. So I had to learn the hard way to involve people. And then the final thing I'll say is give yourself the room to realize that you cannot accomplish everything you've set out to because you're dealing with an, a health crisis, but also a mental health crisis, an emotional roller coaster, and you're also dealing with so many other uncertainties around your business. So give yourself the breathing room to let yourself realize that some things will fall through the cracks and it is okay um, to do that. That said, you. you have to have a schedule and you have to be organized. You have to have a schedule and be organized. Treat your work day as a work day. Um, get out and set your schedule and get everything you want to do accomplished that day. Great. Thank you so much for being so transparent in Didi. Hey, let's ask the question this way to you. So what we heard here now is that there is no longer anything called work-life balance. What we hear now is work-life integration, which is another interesting twist to it, coupled with the fact that people, you know, work from home. So you, you sleep, you wake up to your laptop, you sleep back from your laptop, you sleep, you wake up to your lap. What's your take on, on, on that balance? Indeed, in, has given us her perspective very transparently. What's your take on that, on that balance? Yeah, I mean, to be very honest with you, I, I share her, her perspective um, in the sense that, you know, it's an incredibly difficult time. Um, you don't have the luxury of being able to be around your team members. So there's quite a bit of um, re-communication that actually has to go on. You have to also be cognizant of your team members' um, home dynamic as well because they are also dealing with issues. So I've definitely been in conversation, which is why I'm very, I mean, it's okay for me too, because I, you know, me and my daughter, uh, um, um, you know, we're, we're, we're always at home, we're always together, right? Um, so, you know, I always have to be cognizant of the fact that my other team members are also dealing with the same dynamics as well mm -hmm. in their own homes. Um, and so that means certain things might have to be recommunicated. Uh, I have to allow for a lot of empathy for everybody. Um, I have to give people time and space um, and so on. But I think really, you know, what, what has really helped um, is, is um, you know, one, one good thing I'll say is that um, whenever you have a team that is very passionate about your mission, about what you're trying to do. Like the team I work with today, extremely passionate about democratizing venture capital investment to the average person. When you have a team like that, um, when your family is bought into the mission, things tend to fall into place or to uh, easy to understand from that perspective in the sense that if there are issues that pop up, people can understand. Um, so I he seems to be frozen. Oh dear. I think his network is having a little challenge. Okay, so um, while we wait for his... Um... I think there's this element of it that isn't spoken about concept of work-life integration in a very interesting way um, and allowing space for that content. Hmm. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, now we can hear you. Yeah, e, go ahead. 
I apologize. I had to move around a bit. Yeah, we so, lost you for so a bit. We have, to allow space. we have to allow space for that contest. Um, so for, for me, for example, I'm in Abuja today, which is why there's so much noise. Um, but I had to bring my family with me on this trip. Um, <laughs> because uh, I figured, you know, at the end of the day, there was a limit to which I could just be, uh, I could be away from my family. I know that we need help. And I found a way to make it a nice uh, visit uh, uh, for my family um, so that at the very least there is both, uh, uh, there's some work, there's, there's work and family balance there. And I think more families are going to have to make decisions uh, like that where, you know, uh, to the extent that it's possible, you might have to carry family with you to work and you might have to sometimes bring work work with you back to family and everybody would have to understand because we're all on a journey together and it's the same with my wife's work you know i i uh, my wife works um she 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 produces a lot of artistic content um, we all try to be as helpful to her as we can we provide space for her to work um the good thing about the, the times we live in is there are no more gender roles um so <laughs> everybody <laughs> where well, my my wife always jokes that uh, it's my baby because at the end of the day, you know, whenever she, she gets antsy like that, I have to be the one to, to manage, manage sometimes and things like that. So um, there's no, you know, I, I, was, I was also very lucky. I, I, you know, I think that was the flexibility of entrepreneurship. Um, when I, when I, one of the things I promised myself was that when I started to have kids, I would have plenty of time with them because that was the one element of my own childhood. I didn't, I didn't have the benefit of building a relationship like I have now with my parents um, because they were very, very busy doing church work. So I said, look, you know, that's the one thing, the one gift I would give my, my children is time. So in fact, I left Flutter Wave in 2018 because of that. Um, I, was, I was expecting a baby and I wanted to spend as much time as possible with my family. Um, and now, even now that I'm working, I carry my family around with me for work. Um, <laughs> as expensive as it is, I just find a way to make it work. That's so I think cool. entrepreneurs might need to consider consider those type of approaches as well, to the extent that it's okay. possible. Okay, so we have just two minutes, and so in one minute um, from um, one minute from E and one minute from Indidi, um, the critical question that we have, the last question is, um, as as an entrepreneur, have you failed before? How did you manage, and how did you come through it? Then, any final words for you know every um, attendee on this con this uh, webinar um, who are uh, aspiring entrepreneurs or actually entrepreneurs. So one minute to Indidi and one minute to e. Indidi, would you go first? Thank you so much. Of course, I've made many, many mistakes uh, along the way and I'm still learning every day. And I think that's the message I want to give entrepreneurs is that mm -hmm. you will fall, but you will rise again. COVID-19 has been a shock to all of us and it really hurt a lot of businesses. But this is a time for you to build back better. What you need is a, the passion, the vision, the conviction that God who has brought you this far will be faithful to complete all that he has started in you. And I think for me, the encouragement I want to leave behind is that we started a business in this period and it's thriving. Um, and it's because we saw an opportunity and a gap. So open your eyes, as we say in Nigeria, shine your eye, shine your eye and ask God for divine intervention and a divine wisdom to see opportunities others don't see and to basically roll up your sleeves and pay the price required to prove that you can build a successful and sustainable business. And remember to plan your succession from day one so that you can build a company that will outlive you. God bless you all. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so, so much. Thank you so much. E, let's hear from you. E, can you unmute? For me, my own story has been one of failing my way to success. So I have had a lot of um, failures and uh, <laughs> I will continue to have quite a bit of failures. Um, and really the only way um, that it's possible um, to really it is if you're not failing um, you're not pushing the envelope enough um, so failure is, is a huge part of my story um, my final word to entrepreneurs is that um, at the end of the day um, what what God desires for us particularly as Christian I'm, I, I'm assuming we're all here 
because we're Christian um, entrepreneurs. And what God has designed for us is really for us to be salt um, in the world, and particularly with our businesses. We have to think about our businesses as another avenue for ministry, mm. right? And that means that it needs to be beyond profit. I think that's one thing I keep, um, um, I'll keep harping on with entrepreneurs, particularly from our parts of the world. It has to be beyond profit. You have to treat it as mission, right? Um, and that means that you are identifying a problem and an opportunity to change people's lives by the way that you do business, um, through the products that you offer. And by the time you think about, about um, business in this way, God will handsomely reward you because he, he does that to everybody who diligently serves him. So that's my, my, my word to entrepreneurs. Think beyond profits. Thank you so, so much. Thank you so, so much. This session has been so amazing. Um, I mean, it's been a, a mini MBA of some sort, and I want to believe that um, everybody who has been part of the session has benefited. Thanks to our panelists, to Ndidi and to E for giving us two full hours of your time. We have learned so much. We hope to be able to do this again. And of course, Ndidi has recommended up to six, seven books during the course of our conversations. People, please look for those books and let's get to be, um, you know, um, learners, um, lifelong learners as we go on. And of course, if you'd like to know more, please follow us on um, www.insightsforliving.org. Uh, thank you so much again for attending. To everybody who waited through the two hours on today's session, God bless you and have a good weekend. Bless you all. Thank you so God much. Bless you all. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.